Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Enjoy the Life You're Living. I'm your host, Jana Rieger, and today my guest is Vince Danielson. Vince was the president and CEO of Wello, a virtual telemedicine company that was recently acquired by Maple earlier this year. Vince Danielson is passionate about the Care Anywhere model, and he has a personal understanding of the difference that good care can make for someone. So when he was a teenager, he had a hard-won battle with cancer, and after surviving that, he went on to spend eight years in the Canadian Football League as a Calgary Stampeder. He won two Grey Cup championships, one in 1998 and the other in 2001. It's my pleasure today to have this conversation with Vince about perseverance, about entrepreneurship, about new models for delivering amazing health care. Hi, everyone. I'm Jana Rieger host of the Enjoy the Life You're Living podcast, and I'm really excited today to have my guest with me, Vince Danielson. We're going to hear an amazing story from when he was a teenager and how his pathway took him through a career in the Canadian Football League. He was a receiver for the Calgary Stampeders and a two-times uh, Grey Cup winner, and then how that all ended up with him being president and CEO of Wello. So it's going to be a fun journey, Vince. I'm really looking forward to uh, having this conversation with you and welcome. Good. Great to be on the podcast, Jan, uh, with you and look forward to our great discussion. Yeah. So why don't we just start it off with the story that kind of got it all started, which was when you were a teenager and you ended up being diagnosed with cancer. Um, so if you wouldn't mind starting there and just filling us in a little bit about what the whole story around that and how that influenced um, or would influence the, the path that your life took. Yeah, well, we all um, have amazing lifelines, I call them. If we look into our past and I think um, authentically who we are always comes from these inflection points in our life and um, both the highs and, and the lows and you know, when I was 15, um, you know, I'd, I'd uh, been diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and I was um, really a kid in Vancouver and, and, and I was out with actually uh, about a month ago, I was having dinner with uh, my cancer doctor who treated me, Dr. Susan O'Reilly, and we were just discussing it. And, you know, she had really said, you know, when I got diagnosed at 15, they had never cured um, a teenager of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Oh man, um, the cancer never. So it is like she said, you know, wow, how lucky I was, uh, you know, really just to be here and, yeah. you know, and, and, and going through that, you know, Jana, that, that is like, obviously it's, it's devastating. It takes your whole life away. And, and most so you see what happens to your family and, you know, watching, yeah. you know, the effect it had on my mom and dad and, yeah. and watching how they were mentally struggling. So like, it was a, it was a, a big thing in my life. And, and yeah. um, at the time, like a, a huge challenge and, and definitely a huge struggle. Yeah. And Vince, did your family and did you know that no one had ever been cured of this before? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I think my, you know, I'd always heard kind of percentages thrown around and yeah. whether it's 50, 50 or that. And uh, I, I don't think uh, I, like I knew it was not good. Um, you know, when yeah. I came out of surgery, when they pulled the tumor out, I mean, I think they had me uh, within a half an hour, like hooked up to chemo bags and, uh, and mm. through the kitchen sink at you really quickly. So we knew it was really serious, um, mm. but they didn't share that with me. And, yeah. and that's a good thing. I think that it's important when you go through anything in life that it's good to know reality, but it's also so important to have optimism yeah. and to have hope. And I think there's a really cool balance and my family and the doctors um, did that really well for me as a teenager. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. So, so you're going through this traumatic thing, your family's going through this traumatic thing. And talk a little bit about the care that you were receiving at the time and, and um, what that was like. Yeah, you know, you know, you brought up something before just and talking about like how it has this impacted me and, and being in healthcare right now. And, you know, I really, you know, when we created Wello and even our in live clinic, you know, it, it all comes out of this empathy of the patient journey and really understanding like what is actually happening to people in healthcare. And so what happened to me, what did I really see? I saw 
amazing specialists and doctors. So it was one beautiful thing. But I also saw this, this nurse uh, crew hmm. and I had a nurse named um, Casey at the time. And, and he, like, I just remember the impact that he had on me just the daily as he came in and, and checked things out, but also how he talked to my mom and how he talked to me and how he talked to my brother and sister when I came in. Um, I, I had, I'd end up getting six spinal taps to give you an example. And really what happened was I, I, I mean, I had to stay overnight, of course, when I had these, well, my brothers or, and my sister would stay in the room with me, but they would let mm -hmm. them stay. They bring in a bed for them yeah. and they would let them sleep overnight. So I didn't have to be by myself in the hospital. So, yeah. you know, did that have a big impact on me? Absolutely. And when we create healthcare products and services we just think a lot about what are the struggles but also how do you bring empathy and care into uh -huh. your as you innovate it's not just about technology uh -huh. it's about what comes through that technology whether it's automated or has a provider within it and I, I just it just had a big impact on me and um and I always start with empathy when you start to innovate in healthcare yeah oh that's fantastic that's such a great thought because like you said i think that sometimes the context around the technologies that we're developing we sometimes forget about that like we we get stuck in the like how is this going to work and what's it going to do um but that whole um realm around empathy is so important for patients and um it's the one thing that they rate as um something that they are missing uh, even in the current system of delivery. So, so it's neat that you found that with, um, uh, with respect to this nurse who, um, after all these years, you still remember his name and all this kind of cool stuff. So obviously he made an impact. Um, so, so you, you go through all this, you, you have this amazing nurse, you get better, you get you, amazingly better because you ended up being a professional athlete. Um, and so, on that journey, how did, so you're a professional athlete, but I think I also read that you were working on your healthcare business at the same time. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. So when I, I got drafted to play for the Calgary Stampeders and I came out in, in Calgary in 1994, and uh, I knew when I started into my pro career that um, this was not something that was going to last long periods of time. And I'm, I always kind of try to look ahead about five to 10 years. And I thought, you know, I better get something going. And uh, so I had um, I had started a, a fitness business, Innovative Fitness, actually, when I was about two years into my career in my early 20s. And that was kind of my initial entrepreneurial start. And I would I would um, work in the morning on the business and I'd go to practice at 12 till about six at night. And then I go eat and then I go back home and jump on the computer and, you know, sign up clients and try to figure out how to get a startup off, off the ground. So, yeah, I was juggling uh, both of those. Yeah. And in that business, was it, tell me a bit about that model. Was it a pure fitness training model or were you bringing in other aspects of care into that business? Yeah. Originally, you know, the first startup I did was really a, a pure fitness startup and, yeah. and uh, it was all personal training. And back in the early nineties, you know, that was big in the United States and it was kind of coming into Canada. So we'd set up these uh, studios that were you know, really about 3000 square feet and they would have about 18 employees, but they would really one-on-one -on -one train um, uh, clients um, on their fitness. But one thing we did at the very start is we said, you know, it's not really all about your physical health only. There's other spheres in your life of spirituality. There's mental health. There's your financial health. There's your family. And we started to really start to bring in other aspects. And I think that was way ahead of the game when yeah. people were thinking about building muscles and, uh, and looking better, for instance, from a vanity perspective. And, and, that's, and that's continued on as I've developed um, you know, healthcare products. And I always think about the team. And, and where did I learn that? You know, sports is an amazing, has amazing opportunity to teach us how teams work together. Mm -hmm. uh, I played on poor teams, but I also played on championship teams. And you, you know, how teams work together from a chemistry, from a communication, from a humbleness and putting your ego aside. Mm -hmm. When I thought about that in sport, and then I went into the medical world where there is lots of hierarchy, there's yeah. bureaucracy, there is lots of, there's power, there's titles. And, and, you know, I've really thought a lot about like, how do you um, make sure you keep people's expertise, but how do you start to bring teams together where they don't see those lines of those pillars? Because at the end of the day, the outcomes for the patients are way better when we work together. And, yeah. um, and now we're seeing, uh, you know, across the world, the complexity of conditions, mental health conditions that need, you know, primary medical 
they need mental health providers, they need nutritionists, and yeah. and a lot of platforms are starting to build now into this team approach. So, you know, sports, I think, really helped me um, really look at teams and think differently about it in healthcare. Yeah, and you are quite a rebel when it comes to healthcare, and you know, going against the hierarchy and the and the way that things were um, with the business that's called InLive. Is that did I say that right? Yes, you did. Yeah. Okay, yes, so tell yeah. us a bit about that because that was one of a it was one of the first models for for a new type of care. It was, you know, we really you know looked at you know where the market was in Canada, and and you know let's look at the healthcare system as a whole. Um, I knew that it always had a lot of pain points, but specifically on the cost structure, mm -hmm. you know, 50% of every tax dollar in Ontario, for instance, about 44 cents in Alberta goes to healthcare. And that's for your government, you're paying that through your taxes. And, you know, as the baby boomers rise and more conditions rise, that cost is so high. Yeah. And so I thought a lot about like, how do we add other systems in play so people can get care, maybe take some burden off the public system. So when we started in live, like it was innovative because we were, people were paying out of pocket for medical services that they would usually think about paying for um, or just getting through the, through the public system. And we really um, wrapped uninsured services around a doctor team and really were like one of the first in Canada to sell memberships to, um, to really have a doctor for you and your family. And that was back in, you're, you're, you're looking back in about 2006. I mean, that, that was polarizing as a whole. And today that's very normal. There's so many businesses out there like it and uh, our in live business is such a beautiful business and it gives people the time and the advocacy and, and the care and integrates healthcare around just their, their family doctor services. Yeah, and so we're yeah. really, really proud of, of, of what we've done, what we've done there and the innovation that we, we brought to the healthcare system. So way back then in 2006, where, where did you find most of the pushback was coming from? And how did you either win over those people or overcome um, any obstacles that were around at that time? Yeah, I, I mean, I think when people think of the healthcare system in Canada, I mean, healthcare is a, it is a human, it's almost seen as a human right, even though we pay for it privately through our taxes. And, and so the, it's very polarizing when you mention the word private or pay out of pocket, yeah. um, that shifts um, many people's minds right away. And yeah. even though, Jana, 70% of the healthcare system is paid for privately, you know, think about it, all your drugs are paid for by your employer, if you right. have benefits. Right. All of your um, all of your um, paramedical is paid for by your company, your disability by your company. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, part of this of going into what we were doing was this this paradigm of thought of how Canadians thought about it. And uh -huh. I think that's the first. The second thing you have to think about is the regulatory side of it and uh -huh. how you can bill for things. And that is a whole other way that you have to figure out how to get around those obstacles. But I'll, but I will tell you, Jenna, what wins out. What wins out is that healthcare is about a person and a patient. Mm. And so if you put the patient in the middle, not underneath a system, right? and you say, what are the pain points of that person? What we found is that consumer, that Canadian was, was really willing to step up and innovate with us. And it was about the patient, right? And yeah. so that we were able to look at that and say, okay, the patients want different care. Uh, they want integrated care. They want more time with their family doctor. They want these things. They need it for complex issues. So then all we had to do is really go back and say, great, how do we do this safely under the regulatory system? And, and we added that, worked at the College of Physicians and Surgeons. We added that in, Jenna, and we made, it, made sure that that was proper and, yeah. and, and perfect. And then we just went out to the world and say, let's go out there and do it. And yeah. um, there'll always be naysayers in innovation, but I think we started with the, with the patient in mind. We always kept it there and we started with safe and good regulatory care and, yeah. uh, and then innovation goes. And then suddenly you look back and you say, wow, we were really pioneers, but at the same time, it was only pioneers for the right reasons. And that's for great care. Yeah. Yeah. So then you started pioneering something else out of that, <laughs> which is Wello. Um, so how did, how did, you go from InLive to Wello. And yeah, so, maybe explain a little bit about Wello, what Wello is. For yeah, for sure. So really what Wello is, is um, you, you know, for your family medical care, 
um, through telemedicine and through um, the Wello app, uh, we were able to solve about 90% of people's family doctor visits, um, all the acute care uh, uh, based diagnostics. And we were able to do that online and through an app and through video visits. So, you know, so how did it really start? Again, the same thing where it always starts. It says, look, what is the patient's issues and needs? And I remember sitting in our innovation lab when we created it and we said, like, let's time the amount of time it takes for someone if they want to go see their family doctor. How long? Okay, so they call in, and we wrote yep. this all out. They call in, and they get to the receptionist and say, okay, can I get a, a you know, appointment with, the, with my doctor? And then the doctor says, well, I can see you on Wednesday. Well, it's Monday. Okay, so that's two days. Then you have to drive. Okay, you got to drive, and there's time for driving. Then you have to go pick up your prescription, for instance, after. And then you got to drive home. So we, like, tallied it all up. And we said, what if we could do that in under 20 minutes? Mm. And we thought, would the, would the you know, uh, patients really like this? And so we started writing some pilots. And of course, it was a big hit. And um, you know, we started with that. And that's really the basis of Wello. And it started by saying, like, can we improve the speed to access care? Can we do things online? And where the innovation in the marketplace was, is I was studying what was happening in the United States and the UK. And they were already moving in virtual care. So the trends in the market were there. We then knew the Canadians as a consumer had the pain points and they wanted it. So then back to it, then we just had to figure out how to get the technology set up and then who would pay for this. And we, you know, Jenna, we went to employers and that was a very new innovation yeah. to have a different payer for this. And we did tests and the employers loved it. And so then suddenly you've got, you know, companies like Ikea and Staples and Indigo and these amazing brands jumping on board and innovating in healthcare to get care to their employees and Wello took off and, uh, you know, long story short, um, you know, it's, it's only been in about five years and we've just now merged it with uh, Maple, but, um, you know, it was quite an innovation and, uh, and all about the patient and uh, we should all feel very proud of ourselves, our team, uh, that we were able to accomplish that. Absolutely, because you were doing this before COVID, correct? Yes, yes, mm -hmm. we were. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about what pre-COVID and then COVID hits. Um, how did that affect Wello? Well, pre-COVID, it was we were educating the market, like, you know, on what what Wello even was or what telemedicine. Most people didn't have any idea that you could do 80 to 90% of your family doctor visits online. They would question us on that. I mean, it was an education. Once COVID hit, it flipped it so fast. I mean, I, I'll give you an example. To sign up a, a, a huge national retailer, you would usually spend four to six months signing them up and launching their 10,000 employees. Right. We were doing it in nine days. Wow. <laughs> so you would, you would, our team, because people said, holy smokes, we can't get care. Um, we've got this pandemic, um, you know, our employees need care. And so they just said, wow, like we need Wello now. And they ended up moving it really quickly. And it, it was like a tsunami of um, acceptance um, right across Canada very quickly. And every single one of the business quadrupled in size. Yeah. And it, and I think that if COVID didn't hit, it would have taken another three to five years to get the acceptance for telemedicine. And it yeah. just sped up the, the um, you know, this whole digital innovation. And we were just very lucky to be out in front for a couple of years in advance with some other competitors that did a fabulous job too, so that we could actually deliver care. And, and the great thing about it is that Canadians, more Canadians got care. Um, yeah. people that needed it under the highest stress situations for their families, like we were giving them care and it was, um, it, it just, you, you can feel a lot of pride um, for um, having a team that was able to do that. Yeah. And how did you come up with the business model of having businesses pay for healthcare? Well, you, you, you never really come up with a business model if yeah. you do it properly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's, there's a guy, there's a fellow named Eric Rice that wrote an amazing book called The Lean Startup. And he's got another one called The Startup Way. And, and really, you know, when you look at some of the principles in there is that you only start innovation with the customer in mind. And so what we had done is said, look, we know the trends in the market are going to video visits. We get that. Um, then we knew that 
we could accomplish a lot on video because we have the medical expertise. So that's great. But the biggest thing is that the business model, the first business model you throw out there never works. Hmm. So by knowing that all we did was we ended up taking a um, hundred consumers of our clients that I live and one company. Hmm. And we said for free, we will give you this service for the next six months. All we want to do is learn. Right. And we went out with the consumers and we went out with the company and we learned and we grabbed data and we, and then we interviewed them. We said, what did you like? What did you don't, not like? And then we actually said at the end of it, would you pay for this? And the company said, well, yes, we would. Well, how much would you pay for this? And then we started yeah. to work pricing. I mean, you did it with your customer. It's the best way to innovate. You actually de-risk a lot of business models and it's done properly. Whereas, and I, I know we, I've done it many times with failed businesses, I've always created a business model without customer involvement because yeah. you think you're really smart and you can figure it out. And then eventually, um, what did, what did uh, Mike Tyson say? Everyone's plan's really good until you get punched in the face, right? Right. <laughs> that's, a, that's a quote. So I think every startup is a great idea until the customer really tells you what your business model should be. So you know, it was a fabulous way to innovate. And I, th and I think um, a process that everyone should go through. Yeah, for sure. And let's talk a little bit about nurse practitioners, because I understand that that was a, a core of the uh, Wello model. Yeah, you know, it, it goes back to the initial story. When I thought about um, someone paying for healthcare and a consumerism of healthcare, I thought a lot about, of course, the patient journey. And then I went back to, to Casey and I thought about, you know, the differences in, in the feelings you have with, with maybe a doctor or a specialist to a nurse and, and they're all, and it's nothing good or bad. They're, they're, everyone's got their different expertise, their different personas, the different way they service. And there's something with the nursing model and, and the empathy and the care that came with that and the time they had to spend, um, which to me really created the, the um, I think the power of the feeling of, of that healthcare that I received. So then we went and said, well, could we use nurses? And then I had found that nurse practitioners, of course, um, could do about 90% 90, 90 of what doctors could do in Canada. And so I said, well, what if we partner the nurse personality and persona with their conditions they can serve? And then of course, that the, they were um, um, a lower cost provider which I think is really, really great for innovation too. So we put all those together and we said, we, we believe that the nurse practitioners need the voice, they need to get out there and, and we wanna uh, put them on the pedestal. And that's what we did. And um, I will say that the special sauce of Wello was the nurse practitioners and our medical care coordinators. Um, that group, that team to me is so special in how they talk to people hmm. and how they relate with people Hmm. And uh, there's just something really different there. And, uh, and I have such um, nurse practitioners should be used more and more physician assistants. We should ensure that, you know, the right provider with the right condition at the right cost in the right environment. Yeah. And if we continue to think that way, we can get, um, we can move on some of the higher cost thoughts we have in the system of only putting certain um, maybe traditional providers in play. And, yeah. and we can let those traditional providers like doctors do more, right, than they are, they are doing. And we can really start to flip over the, um, the cost structure. And um, I think all of that happened uh, with, uh, with Wello, which was really dynamite. Yeah. And for the folks who were your um, nurse practitioners and on this virtual model, what were their thoughts? Did you, did you pull that into the whole thing about how did they feel about delivering care this way? And maybe what was working for them, what wasn't working for them. Yeah, and, and I forgot to tell you, when we did our innovation, when I say um, customers first, in, in healthcare, there's there's two customers when yeah. you grow up the model and um, everyone forgets the providers. Yeah. Um, it, it, you know, so if you do not, so in the innovation lab, part of our tests was, first of all, do people like to do video visits? Do they want to be on a video visit for eight hours a day? as they mm -hmm. go through, what does that do to their mental health? Do they need to be a hybrid of in-person and out? We interviewed them all, we rated how they thought of it. Then we went into pay and we started to talk. So we, we really did the same empathetic innovation uh, with the providers that we did with, um, with the uh, patients. And, and it goes back to the, you know, the, it's the service profit chain is pretty simple, but at the end of the day, a highly engaged provider 
creates a highly engaged customer experience Mm -hmm. and creates a good customer retention. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and we've always kind of innovated that way. And I think that uh, the nurse practitioners, um, you know, I spoke to the group just uh, as we're going through the merge with, with Maple and a while back and and they just, um, you know, really commended us on, you know, they didn't know they could do this. Mm -hmm. We had people that said, you know, I wouldn't have made it through COVID as a provider if I did not have Wello as part of my work life. It mm. let me spend time with my family. It, it helped my mental health. It it gave me purpose at home. I mean, it's just really cool to see the impact it had um, on the providers also. Yeah, yeah. So tell us a little bit about the merger. That's really exciting news. Um, tell us what that does for your team, for Wello, and just moving forward with this whole model. Yeah, thanks. Well. COVID did a few things in the market. It not only got acceptance for telemedicine and video visits, it also brought a ton of attention to what I would say was the top five players in Canada, which we were one of in telemedicine. And and then, and then you had above and beyond that, you had groups like Sun Life, Shoppers Drug Mart, and TELUS all come into the telemedicine space with these providers. So, you know, what happened, Jen, and we knew pretty quickly is that we wanted to ensure that we put a merger together with one of the other groups um, because we knew that if we did, it would be a much stronger organization. And I had met uh, Brett uh, Belshed at uh, Maple uh, many, many years ago. And so him and I discussed and we talked about our, the businesses. We said, well, what if we bring these together? And they had a very um, doctor centric model. We had a nurse practitioner centric. Mm. Um, they were built, they, they built their technology different than ours, which was really good. So it was, it was very compatible to, to have ours move and migrate um, over. They were very consumer focused. We were employer focused. Mm. So there was just like, when you put it all together, we said, uh, let's get our shareholders together. Let's bring this together. And so we signed the deal uh, with Maple and uh, acquiring Wello on January 6th. We have just gone through and completed our integration, most of our integration activities. And uh, we're very, very happy to be part of the Maple family, um, you know, from a customer basis, from a shareholder basis and and from a team basis. And, uh, you know, that's how fast technology goes. And and it, I will say having a bricks and mortar business, the clinic business, um, I, I actually cannot believe the speed differences of technology businesses like a Wello right. compared to a, a, a bricks and mortar. And you have to move quickly. Um, the speed of how you manage the business is not close to the same. How yeah. you capitalize the business isn't the same. And, yeah. uh, you know, we were able to kind of juggle both of those as we went through and uh, we're just very happy to, to be with the Maple Group. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. And you mentioned something really interesting. So they are consumer focused um, from a, a payment model. I'm guessing that's what you mean by that. And and Wello was um, business focused from a payment side. Um, so let's talk about consumerism and health. And I'd love to hear some of your viewpoints on that, Vince. Just in general, how do you think over the next what, five years, you'd mentioned five years before. So what do you see happening? What's your prediction about consumerism uh, in health? Yeah, you know, it's no one's got a full crystal ball, but I would say if you look back, you know, five or seven years ago, if I was to answer the question, I would say, what's going to happen? I said, well, there's going to be a big uh, move in healthcare to mobile and digital, which is pretty easy to say. Every other industry's done it, but it's but it's actually very hard to say in in healthcare. Mm-hmm. Um, and because it moved so much slower, it wasn't even close to banking and the speed of banking. So this move to mobile, and you think about consumers in their experience, mm-hmm. when you talk about your mobile phone, when you talk about your electronic medical records that are digital, when you talk about bringing your data, so multiple providers, that has to happen on the electronic medical record platform. And so you're really, you know, what's going to continue to happen is this move to the digital experience where your data and your access will be started, mm-hmm. um, tracked, um, managed on a digital platform, even though you're going to be popping in to see providers physically, of course. Mm-hmm. Whereas mm-hmm. in the past, that model for uh, was, was very much like you would always go in and then your records would be on the side if you ever saw them, you know, as a whole. So I'd say that's the first thing I think of, um, I think of consumerism. The second thing is that how people pay for services you know, is, is, has changed drastically. So there's more and more options 
for people to be able to pay privately for things that they used to be only insured services and, and family practice is only one of them. You, you've got provinces with diagnostics. So consumers have to have options. And I think what we're gonna to continue to see and the government's gonna to continue to move forward is options. So mobile movement, digital options. And then the third thing that I'll put on the plate is home healthcare, mm. healthcare in your home. So this is where the healthcare used to be thought of as this situation where you walked into a hospital uh -huh. or you walked into a clinic. What we have to think about is your home is your healthcare hub uh -huh. and everything will start to service you at home, uh -huh. mobile things coming to your home, pharmaceuticals um, that are delivered to your home, all yeah. of those things. So home healthcare, more services coming into your home, like all of those things are gonna continue. So what does it wrap up into? It's, it's mobile, um, it's payment options, it's home healthcare. And you could think of the amount of business models that are gonna come out of that. And I haven't even brought up Jenna, which is super exciting, is the tracking, is the monitoring yeah. and, and the wearables. The things that you can wear from hardware that are in your phone that will be delivered to attached to your phone, the more and more monitoring that's going to happen, which happens at home or when you're traveling, is the more that you can now start to have your providers come in when needed. And, and it's just going to be a, a continued uh, full um, evolution. So uh, that's, a, that's a lot I threw on the plate there. But um, to me, that is consumerism and, uh, and, and more so, I, I would call it patient-centric care. Yeah, for sure. You know, it's funny when I think about some of the stories from my parents' generation, they talked about Dr. Schropp, who used to come into their home for home business. And I remember as a kid thinking, well, that's so weird. Someone, a doctor came to your house, um, you know, and, and in some ways we've come full circle, but we've done it now with technology. So do you think that in that home health care model, what do you think the place is still for that human connection? Is there still that, that part of it that we're gonna need? Yeah, I, I mean, I would say that one thing I think that we can never forget that there, you know, there is conditions that can be serviced in certain environments. I kind of go back to it, the right provider for the right condition, for the right cost in the right environment. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. when, when you talk about environment, you know, if that's an in-person environment, there is trust that is delivered between providers and between a patient. And I think that everyone who's innovating should always think about that. But I will also say a technology that has no provider touching you, it, that is managing your data and moving it, that is still a very trusted mm -hmm. and, and, and a very um, special uh, place too. And, and mm. when I first went into innovating, I thought to myself, no, it's always about just the human contact. And, and I, I think I was wrong about four years ago that, I, that there are a lot of technologies in our life that we use, that we trust. As long as they're created properly, as long as they are safe and secure, mm -hmm. and as long as they add value to our life, yeah. that can then be attached to a human. I think that the technology can deliver the same as a human, and it just depends um, where. And, and where it's going to be really exciting is the market partnerships that nobody's thinking about, Jana, that you're starting to see. Like you can go to shoppers on their PC Optimum and get healthcare services. Think about Telus that is your, you know, your home and your telecommunications. So now you're starting to see retailers, you know, Walmart, Costco. Mm. So like every, you're going to now see a consolidation of environments. Mm -hmm. that it's not going to be siloed anymore. So be prepared as a consumer to run into things that are healthcare oriented, that are now partnered in an environment with something else in your life. And I think that's really good. I think that partnering on innovation with the whole, you know, economy is better than to do silo things and chip away. And yeah. so, you know, like you're start to see it happening more and more. And I think that creates that excitement. It creates more capital coming into market, creates more innovation. And, ca and Canadian healthcare had, had not seen that I would say five years ago, I would say it was very slow. Hmm. And, and now I see a very different environment and what's happening in the marketplace. Yeah. So what do you think are still is yet our biggest challenge in this realm at the current time? I would say that, um, you know, our biggest challenges still sit in that we are still in a public healthcare system mindset mm -hmm. in Canada, mm -hmm. which, which by the way, it's nothing wrong with, remember, I, I'm only living 
right now because of the public health care system. Yeah. Like yeah. If, if I had to, if my parents had to pay privately for my cancer treatment, I think I'd probably be dead. We were a middle class family. Yeah. Um, you know, so I would say the very first thing is the Canadian healthcare system is dynamite. When you need care, it's amazing. Mm. In saying that, though, there's a lot of things within the system that have to innovate mm. around that, and and governments have to continue to innovate because if not, you can put a barrier of innovation, yeah. and it could be fee code innovation, it could be services, it could be innovation from other countries that will not come to Canada because they don't think they can get over the regulatory side of what's happening um, within the public health care system. So um, I, I speak out of two sides of my mouth because it's okay um, to live in both of those worlds. Of, I love Canadian health care system, but yeah. we need to innovate sooner than later and we need to continue to push it hard and we need to bring private and public together and continue to push the system because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it needs to be there. It needs to be sustainable. And mm -hmm. right now it costs too much to deliver care to Canadians and many are waiting in long lineups to get care. And, the, and I don't think Canada um, should be rated 10th or 11th in the world, which we are at yeah. cost and access. There's, there's no reason we should be 10th or 11th in the yeah. world. We should be the tops. Agreed. hundred <laughs> percent. Well, Vince, I always end uh, my conversations with guests by asking them one question. And that question is, what does the phrase enjoy the life you're living mean to you? Oh, it's a great question, Jenna. And I'm, uh, I'm part of um, an organ, an entrepreneur organization called EO. And yeah. one of the, I've been 16 years, one of the fundamentals as we talk about life happiness is to look at the spheres in your life, hmm. your personal sphere, that's your relationship with yourself, your family and your friends, and then your and your work and what you do in your life. And so what is happiness? To me, it's looking at all of those balls and making sure you're authentic and living your true life. And when one of them's off, mm. which they always get off daily, weekly, that you're able to adjust because there isn't a perfect happiness. Um, there is just a continued adjustment of what's meaningful in your life and what you want to focus your time on. And, uh, and that changes in every stage of your life. So um, our, my formula is always to look at all three, to look at it monthly, to work with my beautiful wife, Colleen, my kids, to talk to them about it, talk to my friends and, uh, and, and try to, like everyone else, you know, to try to get it right. Um, because in this day and age, it's, it's not easy, right? Everyone's been through a lot. And it's not easy, but um, you know, happiness is um, is is a formula that you just got to keep on working out daily. Great. Well, thank you so much, Vince. I agree. That's a wonderful message, um, and um, I love what you said about where we are with healthcare and how we're moving forward with um, health at home. It's been really fantastic to hear your viewpoints on this, and I just really appreciate your time today. Uh, Jenna, it was dynamite to be on, on your podcast, and I wish you all the best and all the luck, and thanks for having me. Yeah, great.